Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Breakthrough, a Dale Carnegie podcast. I'm your co-host, Faith Wright, with our guest co-host, Parker Mays. And today we have a special guest joining us. His name is Sean Newman Maroney. We are so happy that he's come on with this um, new tech that he's built. Um, he's the founder and CEO of Betabox Learning. It's a Raleigh-based education company with the mission of sparking and sustaining hands-on learning in K-12 schools. Betabox provides hands-on learning experience for over 30,000 students a year throughout the Southeast, and Sean is a class of the Forbes 30 under 30 in education and is passionate about all things education and small business. Wow, Sean, thanks for joining us on the pod. We're excited to hear more about this hands-on learning innovation that you've built. Sean, can you just can you start with where this passion came from for first entrepreneurship in general for those that are listening? Yeah, sure. Thanks uh, for having me on, Faith and Parker. It's great to be chatting with you both. And yeah, just a little bit about how this all got started is um, kind of goes way back to when I was kid, a kid. I was always doing weird entrepreneurial things. I did not know that word at the time, but I was uh, like as a little kid, one time living on a cul-de-sac, I had a little Dremel tool, rust, bike rust scraping off business where I would like, you know, kids would bring their little bikes over to my house and I would like, I don't know, like grind the rust off of their their bikes for like 75 cents. I remember that. And then um, I had a weird project when I was in middle school. I don't know if you guys remember the cicada, uh, the cicadas, they actually came out recently again in some areas. You know, every 17 years, these things kind of like take over the um, the landscape. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost biblical in a, a sense, but basically, um, I would collect these. Really, I would I would enlist young kids in my neighborhood to collect these like dead bugs that were just like falling all around the neighborhood, and then I would pluck off the wings and glue them, like hot glue them to buttons, and then I would put a string on the back and sell like cicada wing Christmas ornaments to people. And that was a pretty fun, weird project. And then it just kind of cascaded from there into strange, unusual things. And I didn't really know what that was called. And then I came to college, learned that that uh, idea of just starting things and running with ideas, you know, is actually something you can do in your career. And I was studying engineering at the time and wasn't super excited about just being like a typical um, engineer, not that, that there's anything wrong with it. It just is a path where I needed something additional, something to kind of scratch that itch of trying to start something new. And so that was the original inkling through college of, hey, maybe I should look to combine the skill set that I'm learning about in my classes, engineering, with this more like urge to do something in more of a small team, small entrepreneurial kind of starting something new context. So it was kind of those, the childhood like thing that I was doing that I didn't really know why I was doing it, plus the skill set of what I actually was going to school for that I tried to combine. Yeah, I love it. And, and my story with entrepreneurship, very similar of like, oh, I always was kind of like doing these little projects. But then eventually, at some point, I was like, oh, this is a thing that like exists for your life. Um, and so I loved hearing your story. Yeah. yeah, I definitely see see myself there. And I'm curious, at what point was it that you kind of had that initial idea for Betabox? And then what made you, you know, sure that, okay, this is something that I want to execute on? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when you, you know, you grow up in this little entrepreneurial world, right? And you think of the legends in the entrepreneurial pathway, right? The Elon Musks, the Steve Jobs, um, just whoever your role models are, you know, um, like the, the like Canva, right? The founder of, of Canva, like, got, got, you know, female founder who's built a unicorn, 100 VCs turned her down. Like you hear about stories like that, right? And you're like, oh, that's going to be me. And so that's how I started, started like the path out in college is, okay, how do I go build one of those like, you know, confetti unicorns? And so um, I tried a bunch of different projects, really floundered around and um, just had this like urge to do something, but didn't really have necessarily the skill sets, um, both the management skill sets, but also the technical skill sets to really um, build something out and um, struggled for a couple of years. And then uh, there was this project that I was working on while I was 
you know, trying to go be the next big thing. Uh, and uh, it eventually did become Betabox. So what it was, it was around the time that these things called makerspaces were you know, really getting a lot of popularity. And so this was like a space with a 3D printer and other, you know, prototyping supplies that you could, you know, go to. They were popping up at college campuses. And I was working, I worked, I built one at the school that I went to. And then I just met these couple other guys through a, a volunteer program kind of leadership thing, undergraduate thing. And we all got together and said, hey, maybe we could help universities make their own maker spaces. So it was kind of like a consulting side hustle where me and these two other people were trying to get other schools, other colleges to, you know, pay us money to help them set up a maker space. And we actually did a couple of projects, um, but there was this key issue and it's a common issue in the sales arena, really, regardless of what industry you're in, uh, this kind of notion of like customer education or how do we kind of really show that this is um, something that you should invest in. So we came up with this idea of, hey, let's go make like a mobile makerspace. Let's put 3D printers and laser cutters and all this stuff we're trying to do. You know, let's put it into a shipping container because um, a friend of mine that I was roommates with was trying to build something with shipping containers. I was like, oh, that's cool. Let me like go just copy that <laughs> and apply it to this situation. And so we brought the shipping container around to a couple of different colleges, basically trying to almost like use it as like a prototype to sell them on our consulting. And we quickly learned that nobody cared about these three undergraduates trying to sell these consulting services. Like no one understood it or cared, but they really liked the mobile makerspace. But I did not want them to like the mobile makerspace because remember, I was going to go try to be a unicorn, right? I wanted to go build some really cool tech uh, thing. And I did not want to be like just driving a shipping container around to schools and dropping it off. <laughs> um, you know, I had these br much broader ambitions, but then like, I just couldn't shake it. It just be kept coming more and more interesting. And then we realized that we could bring it to K-12 schools and we could have a lot of impact. And so it was kind of like a one thing led to another. And eventually it just, you know, kind of made sense that, hey, why are you like running from this thing that could be really exciting um, just because it doesn't quite fit the profile of where, where you thought you were going to go. And so that was a little bit of what ended up becoming Betabox at the beginning days. That, that takes a lot of openness and flexibility. You know, you say, I didn't really want them to like the, the mobile part <laughs> and, and your, your openness to then shifting and saying, okay, well, this is working and they really like this. So let's try to, to use the strength of this and combine it with what we really love. And it's that impact focus, right? I think is the key thing and being able to, to bring it to these K-12 schools and have a hands-on learning experience is there's nothing else like it. Um, and so how do you think that the experience that kids get whenever these mobile maker truck, you know, come up to their schools, they're able to have this hands-on experience, what would you say the main impact of that is just based on what you guys have done so far? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, the mission of Betabox is to spark and sustain hands-on learning. So the mobile unit is really about the sparking part. So we have 100-ish kids a day go through this experience, and uh, we don't put them in shipping containers anymore. It's this, like, really cool tech lab that gets dropped off, and we have two staff members, um, could be an engineer and, an, and, a, and a teacher, kind of joining forces to really create an incredible experience for students. And so we are typically only going to um, like kind of more rural, lower income schools that don't have a lot of these resources and the schools are not paying, which is cool. And so we can share more about our business model if you're interested, but basically the mobile unit shows up and they learn something really cool. So one of our common ones is uh, autonomous vehicles. So kids will, you know, learn about uh, self-driving cars. They'll do a little Python programming. They'll fly autonomous drones around, you know, they'll do some like drag and drop programming to have it do a flip and fly around. And then at the end of the experience, it's only about an hour. So it's like really high energy. Um, you, we're doing a lot in a little bit of time. We come together at the end and do a little wrap up, right? Like, what do you think the starting salary is of doing something like this, right? All this fun stuff you just did. And kids are like $10 an hour and we're like $100,000 a year. Like, <laughs> and they're like, oh my gosh. And you, they start to realize, hey, this could be a possible pathway for me from a career perspective, but also, you know, from a um, interest, intrinsic interest perspective, right? A lot of kids really enjoy what they do at the beta box. And then they don't necessarily think of 
do those kinds of hands-on things within the realm of like math and science, right? They think uh, they have like, they have the math and science in like a different category than like the too hard pile or the not fun category. So we try to help them break down that barrier a little bit uh, mentally. And sure, not every kid that leaves one of these, those hundred kids a day, not every kid is going to go become, you know, a Nobel prize winner in uh, chemistry, right? That's, that's not going to happen. But we do have a couple kids that go through this experience. It's just a little kind of like a salient memory for them as they think back on, oh, that was really fun. And it kind of hope, hopefully opens their aperture a little bit. And it's almost like the red, like if you buy a new car and then you see that car everywhere kind of um, effect. We kind of want to have that effect on kids. But as they go through their li lives and school and um, just in their environment, hey, is there a summer camp program that is technology related that maybe they want to apply for? Is, oh, yeah, my aunt is like a, I think she's an engineer. Maybe I should ask her about what that's like, right? You know, so just kind of let's create a cool memory uh, based on hands-on learning that can hopefully inform the career trajectory for a few kids that go through the mobile unit. And so that's that idea of the spark. And then there's some research that we do and surveys and stuff to kind of back up the, the efficacy of all of that, um, which, you know, we can get into if you're interested. And then um, that's the hope. And so, yeah, we do about 30,000, um, you know, we'll do about 300 experiences, 30,000 students a year. And then hopefully, you know, some percentage of those kids, like this was um, an opportunity for them that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise that could be an impactful thing over the long run. You know, it's difficult to quantify, but we think like 10, 20 years from now, you know, maybe there will be a Nobel Prize winner. Oh, hey, like <laughs> I study this because this weird blue box came to my school, right? So that's kind of the hope. Yeah, no. Well, and I just love that whole overview mission of, you know, spark and sustain hands-on learning. Like that idea really resonates. And especially in a world where like, how how are you finding with, you know, how, uh, you know, we, we know attention spans are kind of getting shorter, right? And there's this whole thing where, you know, we're, we're gravitating towards just like quick dopamine hits, right? And so how are you guys kind of like living in that world, right? Is it, you know, I know you're talking about high fast paced experience, right? Like, tell us more about competing with like even social media and things like, do you, do you feel like as kids have gotten more in that world that it's harder to do some of that like sustained mm -hmm. learning over the longer term like I'm curious to hear your experience there yeah so I think for that's a good question I think there are I mean so the spark it's kind of almost easy and we do have a little bit of a framework of how to engage students and so I'll share what that is um, the sustain is we work with the teachers a lot afterwards and that's like a whole separate set of challenges um, we overall feel like hands-on learning uh, is a great way to engage students because you're really engaging like all of the senses. It's tactile, it's visual. And so that's like one way to think about it is if you're going to compare like lecture based instruction, um, which has its place for sure with something hands on, then, you know, it's uh, you're already kind of you are you already have a little bit of a competitive advantage compared like you know c competing against TikTok and Facebook right um so you have a li little bit it's not the full solution but circling back to the what we do within the experiences the way we think about like kind of engaging students is uh, if you think of like the flow state graph of challenge um and skill so like um this is just in general in life, you know, when you find that you're most fulfilled or you find some, an experience is like most meaningful, it tends to be um, when some, when it's um, challenging um, and you have some skill in that thing, but you can't have, so it can't be too easy. Like you, it can't be like just very rudimentary, um, but it also can't be like too hard. So there's like this Goldilocks zone of like, where like you have a little bit of skill in this thing and it's like right at kind of the edge of what you know, there's like this little zone of um, flow state, right? And so that's where we try to calibrate our experiences. So when students come in, you know, we want there to be a little bit of a challenge. So you may not figure it out the first time you're gonna try and fail and you kind of have to get your creative problem solving juices flowing a little bit. Um, but we don't want it to be so difficult that um, you lose interest in STEM, right? So we don't, we like the kind of the do no harm principle. We don't want kids to come into our experience. Something is too hard. Uh, for their grade level or for their skill level. And then they realize, oh, STEM is not for me. I don't belong here. That was too hard, right? So like, we feel like a good way to engage and kind of compete with like the world around is just like, kind of see if we can have a small, uh, like, can we get kids into that little like mini flow state, right? Where they're, where the challenge and the skill is like kind of at that level of, um, is at that right Goldilocks level. I, I love that flow state that you're talking about. Cause just with my 
everyone can, I think, attest to this, that if something's too easy, they're not going to take interest to it, you know, kids mm -hmm. and, and adults alike, or if something's too challenging, they might work at it a little bit, but then be demotivated if they aren't getting anywhere or making any progress. So um, I, I just love that flow state that you're talking about. Whenever, whenever you're saying, um, you know, you're speaking with educators as well, what piece of advice or messaging do you talk to them about in terms of bringing this to their school or the benefits of how this will impact their students? What's your message or advice to them? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, we do try to give advice where we can, but we also need, we also want to listen a lot. The teachers have been through a lot over the last couple of years. I mean, through the pandemic uh, and just the learning loss is the word for it, just like the associated challenges that have come with that. I mean, teachers are under so much pressure more than they ever have been. And so, you know, one thing that we don't want to be is just one additional thing, right? Teachers get thrown, but so much gets put on a teacher's desk. And we don't want to just be like, hey, here's one more thing that's making you have to do more stuff out of the classroom, go take this course or professional development, or, you know, you have to, you have to teach this, right? So, you know, that's kind of the first thing is let's not just try to be like one more thing that makes a teacher's life more difficult. Let's try to be something that takes, uh, that makes their lives easier. And so taking away friction. So there are a lot of reasons that hands-on learning does not happen. Overall, you know, we have a lot of folks outside of education will be like, well, oh, well, hands-on learning, it's such a natural thing. Like, that's how I learned, you know, I became an engineer, tinkered in my garage, right? Why can't the public school system be like that? You know, the issue not, isn't necessarily that people within the education system don't know that hands-on learning has value or, um, you know, aren't interested in bringing more of it into the classroom. The will is not the problem. The problem is the way. There's a lot of uh, small details within how the public schools work that can make it a challenge. So um, one of those things is getting access to the hands-on materials. So, um, you know, as a teacher, the average teacher spends around $600 out of pocket every year getting like paper and school supplies, right? And that's just an average, right? You've got teachers that do way more than that, especially if they're trying to do hands-on stuff. Like, uh, so that's a challenge, right? To, you know, write a $10 purchase order to get your principal to sign off on bringing, getting some supplies, right? I mean, that that's a bureaucratic headache, right? So that's a challenge. Another challenge is like the um, curriculum access, right? So like we kind of put the burden on each teacher to be this like curriculum designer, super creative, um, you know, thinker to develop these like amazing lesson plans that are standards aligned and all the things that they need to do, right? So, you know, we're, we're putting the burden on them to do that, right? So there's all these pressures. And so for us, it's, it, it's not necessarily giving them advice or convincing them that hands on learning is a good thing. It's about taking away the blockers between them and what a lot of them want to do, which is, you know, create this engaging hands on learning classroom. So with our sustain uh, stuff, the second half of the mission, we have like a web platform that is available to teachers where they can check out equipment from us for free so they can get a 3D printer shipped to them and send it back at the end of the semester. Same thing with drones and robot cars. So we get rid of the equipment uh, barrier and then we have like lesson plans and, and trainings and stuff available as well. So yeah, I would say it's just about how do you remove friction? And so if someone's thinking about like a project while they're listening to this or a customer, right, of, you know, how do you... Um, how do you help them? It's like, think about where, where is the friction, right? Have like an engineering mindset to this. Like, so, you know, if you remove the friction between what somebody is naturally trying to do and where they are today, that could be like a really good business. So that also eliminates the customer education. So if you're trying to come up with something brand new and nobody totally really gets it, uh, that can be a challenge, a really uphill battle. You're going to have to spend a lot of money on marketing. You're going to have to spend a lot of time educating them as a customer. Kind of that, uh, that was my experience with the mobile make the initial mobile makerspace consulting thing uh, that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, try to rethink that a little bit and think more about, okay, what do people already want to do? What is like a no brainer thing people would love to do? Uh, the classic example being like the faster horse Henry Ford thing, right? What do people want to do? They want to get from point A to B super efficiently, cheaply, quickly, safely. Um, okay, great. So faster horse, that's one way to do it. That's like the standards paradigm that people would understand. But what if there was like a whole new idea, right? So think about that as like, what do people naturally want to do? 
what is the what is the friction between and is there like a solution that can fill that space so that's what we've tried to do with teachers very long answer to your initial question um but hopefully it's sort of helpful well i love that and and i i love kind of thinking through it for from the student side as well you know there are students out there listening who are passionate about accessibility they're passionate about um, making education more accessible you know and, and you mentioned it early on that you're oftentimes going to some, you know, schools that have lower funding or schools that might not be able to traditionally have access to something like this. Tell us more about how you were able to make that model work of being able to, to get, you know, Betabox into those schools. But then also, you know, for a student who is passionate about accessibility of education, like how can we be going out as individuals and making an impact, you know, at a smaller scale? Yeah. So like a little bit about the, the sort of business model. So some people are surprised to learn that Betabox is a for for profit, not a nonprofit. And we did struggle with how we were going to set it up at the beginning. And the reason we initially went the direction of, hey, let's go for profit is um, one, you know, it I, that was just more the skill set that I was that I was learning about through through some things. But then also we we looked at at the landscape and saw uh, there was like a lot of mobile science trailers and different things. Um, that were structured in a more nonprofit way. And what we noticed was uh, they weren't quite as sustainable as I think that the originators or founders wanted them to be. So, you know, there was like a grant that they may have gotten and it was able to function and go to schools for a little while, uh, but then that grant expired and they weren't able to sustain. So uh, what ends up happening is whether it's a mobile unit that sits at a parking lot or a 3D printer that a school buys, and then it gets, you know, broke and breaks and sits dusty, you know, there's a sustainability challenge within this space. So we thought, hey, like if there was a business model behind the scenes that could sustain this without having to kind of rely on an annual funding grant cycle, then we could create impact for, you know, but long after, you know, we're even around, right? It could exist for a long time. And so that was like the first principle is let's try to get this a sustaining thing. And we kind of made a 50-50 bet, let's go for profit. So that was the first thing. And then that was not the whole solution. <laughs> uh, we struggled for a while to figure out what actually was the business model. And so like um, something I like to think about is have like deeply thought through opinions, but hold them loosely. Uh, so like really do, a, really think through something, is it gonna work or not, test it out, but like be willing to change your mind when the evidence is um, obviously not, in your favor. So we tried a few different things. First, we tried to charge schools directly uh, per day for the experience. And we were able to, you know, sell it and that worked, but we weren't able to sell it to the right segment of schools that we wanted to go to. So we could sell it to private schools and charter schools, um, but we couldn't quite get to the lo lower income rural areas that we felt like the beta box could be most effective. And so uh, that didn't really work. We threw that out. Then we tried to do like really big partnerships with big industry partners. So, you know, we did a partnership um, with a large pharmaceuticals company to do a national sciences uh, hands-on learning tour. It was really good. It was a nice size contract, uh, allowed us to pay ourselves a little bit and things of that nature. Uh, but we really became extremely beholden. It's called customer concentration. So we became really beholden to this one client, right? They were like 80% of our revenue. And so anything they wanted us to do, we had, to do. We had no choice, right? So um, that was a different kind of challenge that we had to mitigate. Then we made a decision to stop doing these very large industry partnerships. We still do industry partnerships, but um, not quite to the same scale that that one was. And what we have settled on is a mixture of three kinds of customers that ultimately uh, fund the experiences that we go to schools. So while some schools do pay for it directly, school districts, uh, the majority of how we get to schools is um, government. So we do work with government. So we're in the North Carolina state budget uh, right now, and we have some other kind of government state relationships. We have a higher ed, higher education relationships. So uh, we work with a really awesome uh, university in Alabama that allows our mobile units to go to all of their feeder high schools and middle schools in a 10 county region. And then, like I just mentioned, we do still do some industry partnerships. And so those are the individuals or the segments that have their each unique reasons for supporting what we do. And that allows us to go to schools. And that has finally worked in terms of a sustainable model that allows us to have the impact we want to have for the kind of segments of schools that we want to have, um, while also 
you know, building a sustainable entity that can pay people well, because it's a really hard job to be a beta box guide. It's a lot of work and, um, you know, allow us to kind of keep doing, doing what we're doing and keep investing in it. Uh, so another long winded answer for your first question. And then your second question yeah. around kind of how to get um, involved. I mean, you know, you can always, you can always be, uh, you know, you can always join Betabox. Uh, so we always are looking for um, contract uh, instructors and, and full-time folks. Um, but I mean, beyond that, think about like ways to kind of just reinvest in the community. So like, if you are a STEM professional, maybe you could contact a local school. Hey, you know, do you guys have any um, opportunities for me to speak to the students? Come in, share my knowledge, right? You know, especially if you're you know, if you're, if, you know, students need role models, right? So especially, you know, if you're um, like, you know, a STEM professional of color or a female, like it's really important uh, to get role models, higher visibility, right, out there for folks. It's, so you feel like you belong in technology. So that's one thing to think about. There's other ways too. Um, but as a student, you know, just just kind of keep, be just continue to focus on like what you're interested in too, because you know ultimately like the world needs people that are passionate about what they're doing. So if you haven't quite figured out like what your what your lane is exactly, you know you don't necessarily need to, um, you know think about giving back quite yet. You can also just be like, well, what do I really what what what, what is my niche really in like the world, right? The oxygen mask principle where the airplane, you know, put yours on first. Like figure out kind of like where you're at. Don't get super burned out super early on a bunch of different causes if like you're not quite sure, um, you know, where you want to end up. Yeah, love that. And and fantastic. And I love the, the oxygen mask example there in that, you know, when I am able to know and live in my purpose and my passion, then I can then go and help other people and help other people connect with theirs. And so, um, yeah, really love that. And like, Sean, I'm curious, as you're kind of looking out into where Betabox is headed and just where you're headed as a, as a founder and individual, um, what does the future look like? What are you getting excited about for the future of Betabox? I mean, we're just in a nice spot where we've got a team that is really doing an amazing job. Uh, I've been uh, having, I've had an interesting year uh, in February. I was in a pretty rough car accident and I was in the hospital for a month. And so I had to really kind of just give up the, the reins. And uh, my business partner, Greg, was really like in charge of uh, the whole, the whole team, the whole company for that month. And I really realized that I had to uh, make some changes. I was um, still really involved in a lot of stuff on, in the operations day to day. And I was able to find a great guy. If you're familiar with like the um, kind of the EOS or traction yeah. uh, frameworks at all, or, or those books, which I would recommend uh, if you're interested in entrepreneurial things, there's that idea of the visionary and the integrator, which if you're not familiar with that, you know, if you're listening, the visionary is kind of the kind of the ideas person that's not super detail oriented. And then the integrator is like the person that really, you know, gets, get, it takes action on those ideas. So like, you know, Elon Musk would, would be nothing without like Gwen Shotwell, who's an amazing engineer and really runs SpaceX. And so that's an example. I was able to find a person like that and that, that's been great. So this person's on the team and I really have two people um, that are kind of fulfilling that integrator role now. And that's been great because it's allowed me to kind of free up and, and be able to focus on what is the future, right? So we're looking at making some big investments in our um, our like software platform for teachers. That's really cool. Continue to expand into more states and just really also continuing to focus on the research around what we do. Like Betabox is a really interesting research platform just from an education research standpoint, being able to um, ask a hundred kids a day different questions about how impactful was this experience is um, just a really cool source of education data. So we've been kind of getting into the weeds of that too recently. Awesome, Sean. Well, it's so cool also to hear about the, the integrator portion, you know, finding people around you that, that have maybe those strengths so that you can work smarter, not harder in a sense, you know, build people around you uh, to get where you want to be. And it seems like as you look to the future and are wanting to expand and just gain more data from students, um, I have no doubt that this is going to to blow up. I, I want to see it in all 50 states. I think that'd be amazing, right? That'd be awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Sean, if people want to follow your journey, um, you know, as you go on over the next few years, where can they find you on social media? Or how can they uh, find Betabox? 
Yeah, our website for Betabox, just type in Betabox. It's very easy to put Beatbox into um, Google. So just flip the ENA and you'll find us. Um, then I'm on Twitter uh, under Sean Maroney. You can find me there and um, those will be some good spots. Okay, awesome. And for those of you listening, also follow Dale Kernge East NC on Instagram. Hit the subscribe button if you don't already uh, to follow um, to get updates on more podcast episodes whenever they release. Thank you so, so much, Sean, for joining us. This has been super impactful uh, for listeners who want to just really spark and sustain, again, this hands-on learning experience. Man, this is awesome. Thank you again. Thanks, Parker, for co-hosting. And we'll see you guys back at the next episode. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.